All right, hello everyone at home. This is Adelaide Eternal, and you're with us for one of our monthly tournaments. We run three formats in the South Australia region, Vintage, Legacy, and Highlander. And this month around, it's going to be Vintage. So you're here in the booth with me, Sarvan McClinton, and uh, Beckett Wolf. G'day, guys. So this is round one. We've got uh, Trevi Lim on the left, and he's running a deck that he calls Paradoxical Options. And on the right, we have James Manning, who's uh, on a typical Ravager mud list. And since they're mulliganing now, we may as well have a look at their deck lists. So first of all, let's look at uh, Trevi Lim, who's on the left. So the uh, Paradoxical Options deck that he is running uh, focuses around the Paradoxical Outcome card, a new card from the Kaladesh set. And that is all about... Uh, playing lots of zero mana artifacts that uh, tap for mana and using them to cast Paradoxical Outcome, floating some mana and returning them all to your hand and drawing an exorbitant number of cards, which usually nets you another Paradoxical Outcome. A lot of people will probably know uh, or have seen Hercules Recall, which is two mana instant and you get to bounce all artifacts attack a player controls on his hand. This is very similar when it came out. A lot of vintage players were excited because this is four mana, but uh, you get to draw for each permanent you return. Now, in vintage, when you're running Moxon and stuff like Lotus and uh, Mana Crypt, Mana Vault, you can actually generate more mana uh, than it costs to cast. I mean, you know, obviously the Moxes cost zero and tap for one, so uh, even though it costs four, you're actually generating a lot of mana. You're generating a lot of storm count and you can generate a lot of draw cards. So this deck is explosive, uh, and as such, it runs a bit of protection. So unlike a lot of Storm lists, this is running four Force of Wheels uh, to protect the combo, and it's also running two Defense Grid, which is normally a sideboard card. So Yeah, I like it, and uh, some of you will be familiar with Reed Duke's list that was popularized uh, during some coverage uh, a month or two ago. And he was running uh, something that was really all about being all-in on you know, winning turn one and being lean and mean with a whole bunch of uh, mana rocks. And if it's not a rock, it's drawing your cards. And that's basically it, um, or protecting that combo. Whereas Trevi's uh, options list here is running uh, a cool card here called Cunning Wish. And uh, that's all about searching out a uh, an instant, but it can be one from your sideboard instead. So his sideboard is filled with a bunch of uh, interesting cards things for different situations and um, uh, he's even got things like a Noxious Revival which is an instant that allows him to put that single win con, that Tendrils of Agony, back on the top so he can uh, drain drain two with Storm. Another option is a, a lot of these lists are running very hateful cards towards Storm and uh, Trevi's got Brain Freeze in the sideboard which is another storm card. It mills for each storm count. Now it's not as powerful as um, tendrils because it doesn't. Uh, it requires a lot higher storm and it doesn't gain you life. But um, sometimes when you're going off, you're really going off, and the storm count doesn't matter. And you know if they've got some way to protect against a ley line, uh, sorry, a uh, tendrils, then you can brain freeze them, which is an alternate option. I think that's why he's got it in the sideboard. Mm. I like it. So uh, let's look at the other deck list. So this is James Manning's list. And if there's ever a deck that the Paradoxical decks don't want to face, it's a deck that has uh, four Thorn of Amethyst in the main and four Sphere of Resistance. So artifacts that can be placed down on turn one by James and cause all of uh, Trevi's spells to cost one more. That's right. Um Lodestone Golem was recently restricted in Vintage, uh, so you can only play one Lodestone Golem in your deck. It's a, it's a great card. It's a classic Vintage spell. It's a critter with 5-3 uh, base power and toughness, and all non-artifact spells cost one more. Uh, and against a Storm deck in the main board, if he can land that early, that's going to be really tough to play through, I think, for for, for Trevi and... Um, you know, stuff like Trinosphere as well. It's going to turn all those moxes which Trevi wants to generate mana on. Uh, it would just not become viable anymore. So James Absolutely. could have a really powerful start as well here. Yeah, I think. definitely. And uh, once 
uh, James has set up some kind of lock and uh, all he needs to do is just land one or more of these creatures and beat face. And thankfully his creatures also disrupt. So Phyrexian Revoker turns off the activated ability of uh, a permanent of his choice. And Thought Not Seer, obviously, when that comes into play, he gets to uh, essentially uh, duress his opponent, uh, exile a card from his hand. That's all right. He's never going to get that uh, card back when Thought Not Seer leaves play. Uh, the opponent gets to draw a card, but Trevi's never going to destroy the Thought Not. It's never going to leave play. So it's uh, it's really powerful to be able to exile some of the key cards like the Paradoxical. Um, and, as, and as we said... You can get some with El Drazi Temple. Uh, you can get some of these cards out really, really quick. Good. Uh, so we'll talk about sideboards a little bit later, but uh, obviously there's a, a deck list error there in James's um, uh, list. It doesn't actually only have four sideboard cards, but what we'll do is we'll get James to comment on the video and and put the rest of his sideboard up in a comment. But otherwise, let's go back to the game and see if they've all shuffled up and they're ready to go. All right, so uh, Trevi's just resolving a mulligan, and uh, the paradoxical deck does mar uh, does mulligan okay um, because you just have the ability to explode. You know, you can have a a hand that has a time twister in it or something, and really draw yourself back up into uh, seven cards and also screw your opponent. Yeah, Trevi wants to essentially win turn one. He's um. He's not looking to mess about in this matchup. He's not looking for any sort of card advantage of that paradoxical outcome. He just really wants to win before the sideboard cards get played. And um, It's possible that one of these cards is going to be played now because James is on the play and he has three mana at his, at his disposal because Ancient Tomb taps for two mana and two life. And probably some kind of lock piece is coming out now. It's going to be a, a thorn or a sphere, one of these things that says you're... Uh, all spells cost one more to play if you're usually affecting your opponent, but oh, this one's and there it cool. is. Um, that's pretty tough. You know, he might be able to work around the Lodestone Golem because Lodestone says artifacts, and Trevi's got a couple of artifacts in there, obviously, but uh, all spells cost one more. <sighs> Trevi's got that hand. Chain, of Vapor, Chain of Vapor in his main board for stuff like this, and it just goes to show how badly Trevi's ruined by a card like that, but is he going to have it necessarily? So, As you can see, he has to pay one to play his Lotus. And uh, Lotus is a very good card in the uh, uh, when your opponent is on mud because it allows you to still have decent uh, plays through a Thorn type effect. But James uh, really doesn't care that his hand doesn't have enough mana sources to cast his spells. Uh, he draws this Wasteland. Um, and... He he doesn't mind that he's being taxed by one because he knows that it's shutting off Trevi's ability to just win on the spot. That's exactly right. Um, Trevi's got a few really cool cards in here. I really like Mind's Desire. That's um that's a classic Storm spell as well. Uh, I don't think he's going to be doing it in this particular no, game, but definitely good for the control matchups because um, you have to counter each of those spells individually. What's really interesting about a list like Trevi's is he's he's running Time Walk, but you know as great as Time Walk is and we all see it as a classic vintage spell. Do you actually think it's that good in Trevi's list, Sal? Um, to be honest, I would say Time Warp is one of the worst cards, especially one of the worst power cards, I would say, um, in decks like this where you it's really just a rampant growth. Whereas in the Mentor decks where you get to uh, uh, cast Time Warp and then attack with a whole bunch of creatures, Time Warp is probably one of the strongest cards. <laughs> So very polarizing based on uh, whether you're playing creatures or not. Chrome Mox is uh, something we don't normally see in Vintage because it's outclassed by the other Moxen, but Trevi's list wants every possible sort of artifact ramp. And, uh, his Exile Tinker there, I'm surprised by that. I would have thought Tinker's one of his outs here because True. he's not going to be out of Storm and the, you know maybe he can Tinker for... for some way to get out of this. The issue with, with uh, a Tinker here is post-sideboard, it's great because you get to get a Blightsteel Colossus from the sideboard, which these Storm decks, they don't want to draw it in game one, they just want to explode. But in the main deck, usually the Tinker is getting you a Memory Jar. Memory Jar, that's it. I was just looking through Trevi's list, wondering what he'd Tinker for. <coughs> the Memory Jar is a great spell. I haven't seen it in a while. I love it. Um, but... 
it's actually sort of more card advantage. Uh, gets you a lot of cards in hand. And against that sphere, you know, Trevi's still going to have a bunch of cards in hand. You've got to ask yourself, am I losing games with lots of cards in hand? And if that's the case, then you don't need any more card advantage. Yeah. So here out comes another lock piece. So um, as you can see, uh, James really just, as much as he wanted his mana to cast his creatures, he's throwing it away. He's throwing away the wasteland. He knows that the priority here is to stop Trevi winning. And he's deployed the Chalice of the Void, which basically counters all spells that cost one. I can see Hercules Recall being a really good out for Trevi at the end of turn. Bouncing the chalice, bouncing the sphere. Absolutely. And then going off. Do you think it's viable? Maybe I'm just saying this because I see the tinker, but do you think it's viable to play the Colossus in the main board? Uh, not in the Storm decks. Definitely in other decks, I can see it. He can generate um, a lot of mana, though. So. It's true. Uh, I've seen uh, I've seen people hard cast Blightsteel Colossus, especially when you have an academy and that kind of thing. Um, Revoker. Now... Revoker, a lot of people think, is a Pythene Needle on legs, but it actually isn't. Pythene Needle stops mana abilities, and it's really important to note that Phyrexian Revoker stops non-land cards. So you can name the Moxin, you can name Lotus. I reckon, not sure what he's named, I reckon he might have named Lotus here, because uh, James doesn't need the Lotus, he's going fine without it, um, and... It's one of the big powerhouses in Trevi's decks, and he's mm. got it out. So, uh, Phyrexian Revoker, really strong here. You can switch off a lot of things, and uh, in this case, hitting a ramp spell like that, I think is going to be great, and I think he's probably going to keep it in post-sideboard as well. Definitely. It's nice to have a piece of disruption that attacks for two. Um, so, Trevi here is... He's not just going through the motions, because his outs really are Hercules Recall. If he can, it's a real out. Turn. It mm. is. It is a real out. But you know, it. I think it's either Hercules and Chain of Vapor, and that's it. That's about it. Mm. And unfortunately, Chain will be countered by Chalice, so he's really all in on getting a Hercules. And as you oh, can see with the um, second with spear, the spear, it's it's an unwinnable game for Trevi, given that the Black Lotus has been turned off. If the Black Lotus wasn't turned off you have the opportunity of generating five mana, casting Hercules Recall for two, and then paying the two more for the taxes. Hercules Recall is all about, you know, end of your turn, returning all the artifacts that that player controls to their hand. Speaking of which, going into sideboards, Trevi has another Hercules. Um, and I think Hercules does want to come in here. Remember that Hercules is actually quite good uh, to target yourself in this deck because... Just simply for storm and mana, as, as I said earlier, a lot of these spells, rocks, uh, generate more mana than they cost. So you can just Hercules yourself, uh, and you've got you know three or four Moxen out, and then replay that. You get a huge storm count, and you actually get a bit of mana out of it. So it's versatile in that sense that it, it can bounce back a Lodestone, which might be beating you down, a Frexian Revoker, and uh, it also might bounce one of those crucial spheres. So mm. I think he wants to side that in for sure. Definitely. So the, the issue sometimes with these uh, wish decks, because all of the wishes revolve around tutoring from your sideboard, um, he good needs point. to decide exactly what cards he's bringing in now and what cards he wants to leave in uh, the sideboard to, to wish for. It's possible that you know wish is not a very good card after sideboard because... Um, at the end of the day, it's three mana, and he's being taxed in the process. He really wants to be explosive on turn one. Yeah, he's only got one wish, so I don't know how much you want to play around that, and if really all you want to wish for anyway is a Hercules or a Chain of Vapor, then it's better just to bring them in. I, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, as I said, he's only running one mish, uh, one cunning wish in the in the main board. What else do you reckon he wants to bring in here? So he's bringing in Chain of Vapor, that's for sure. Um, he's bringing in Echoing Truth simply because he needs it. It's unfortunate, and there's especially unfortunate situations where your opponent has Thorn of Amethyst and Spear of Resistance, and you can't bounce both of them. But in a game like this, imagine if he had Echoing Truth. If he if his uh, Black Lotus wasn't turned off, he pays four mana to pay through the two taxes, and Echoing Truth's back the uh, two Spear of Resistances. 
So uh, I think it's definitely a worthwhile card against this matchup. I mean, there's some people will say, if you're on the play, don't dilute your deck. Go in, go whole hog and try and win turn one. And I think that's a legitimate uh, strategy. So Especially for Trevi. Definitely. So the um, uh, as you can see, James brought in two cards. He brought in a uh, Pithing Needle and he brought in a Relic of Progenitus. So um, the Pithing Needle is most likely his essentially fifth Revoker. He's just going to play it as another lock piece to turn off something on board or turn off something that he assumes his opponent has four of in the deck, like a Mox Opal, um, just to, you know, if, if it's blind. But usually it's going to be a Revoker after the fact. Yeah, so I, I totally agree about um, diluting your deck. The only reason Trevi's got a bit of flexibility here is two main board defense grids aren't really relevant against the Ravager Mud, so I think he's more than happy to side those two out, and he's got two free sideboard slots. The Toxic Deluge is the one I think is on the on the board. I mean, if you're not mm. siding it against this deck, what are you siding it against? But it does hit a lot of things, but also those spheres are going to hurt it, the Lodestone's going to hurt it, uh... Even the paying the life might hurt if they've got a thought not seer that you're trying to pay for a life for, and it might have already got in for a couple of swings. So I think maybe you want toxic deluge, but that could be the the point at which you start dilating mm. your deck too much. Yeah, you have to be careful. So uh, when we saw the uh, sideboard flash up there on the screen when uh, Trevi flashed his hand over. Uh, you could see that he's brought in the island. Obviously, this is against those wasteland decks. You want to have an additional mana source. Um, but he, the main thing that he was taking out were the defense grids. He he runs them main because they're really good against control, but also they're an artifact. They're just a permanent that you can sometimes run it out and bounce it back with paradoxical outcome when you need to in the slow games. Um, but they're an easy takeout, so that's that's uh, good to see. The island is interesting, and uh, one thing that people who aren't used to vintage might be baffled by is the number <laughs> of lands in Trevi's deck. Now, this is particularly short because of the nature of his deck with the amount of um, rocks he's got for mana, so Moxon and Soaring and Lotus Petals, but mm. Trevi is only running 10 lands. Nine in the nine in the main board, and uh, one more post side. So it's very very short on lands. Obviously, the best of which is Telerian Academy. This is the main reason why these uh, uh, paradoxical storm based decks are not favoured in the mud matchup. I've seen a lot of them. Mana sources. I've seen a lot of them run Expedition Map, which is pretty underpowered card, but. The Telerian Academy is just so good that sometimes that is actually viable and it is a rock, it's one mana artifact, I mean you can storm it. What do you think mm. about running Expedition Map? It's a slowly but surely type card. You you can play it. Oh, okay, so James keeping this hand, I assume, it's got mana sources and it's got disruption. I saw a lot of mana there. I think I saw Ancient Tomb and at least a Mox. So um, He wants to go off on turn one. He wants to play something that locks out his opponent and then continue playing things that keep his opponent from playing spells. But the issue here is that he's on the draw. So if Trevi has an explosive hand, James will lose. Has he brought Flight still in, do you think? I think it's a nice out in these situations, simply because your opponent does not have the ability to deal with Flight Steel Colossus. The, you sometimes see cards like uh, Duplicant in these decks, but... Uh, James does not have Duplicant. It's a six mana creature that when it comes into play exiles another creature and becomes a copy of its power and toughness only. So uh, it's a nice way for these shops decks to uh, to deal with Blightsteel. Jeez, Same. I reckon Trevi could run Duplicant. I mean, it's hard <laughs> castable. You get rid of Thornos here, get that draw, and you've got another blocker. But uh, he's going all out with the Blightsteel. That's a yeah. one, swing, one swing and they're dead if they don't have any blockers. So... Uh, We'll see if he sided it in. Mm. I'm not sure. I think, as we said, he doesn't want to dilute his deck. He just wants to get that turn one win. He is. He has mulled to five. He's scryed to the top. And the issue here is he was either uh, mulling to get a very ex aggressive explosive start um, or he was mulling because the hand was unplayable. Usually with these storm decks, the hands are rarely unplayable. You just need one draw spell and a bunch of mana. 
Yeah, and what what do you think about running those two out? He didn't have a land drop, as we said. That's not too critical, but the mana crypt is interesting. I mean, is he scared of Chalice of the Void? He's mainly scared of the fact that some kind of tax effect will cause him to be unable to play a uh, mana source. So uh, he rushes them out here because he knows that he's not going to get killed because because of being in the long game and losing mana crypt flips. He wants to win next turn or the turn after that at the latest. So there's a few pros and cons there, guys, because there's actually a few pros to keeping it in your hand. First of all, you actually, uh, the mana crypt, you have to roll a dice or flip a coin and you've got a 50-50% chance of taking three damage and uh, even on a fast deck like this, that can add up and also because it adds to your storm count. And not playing it out is always uh, good as well when you're expecting them to revoke it, turning it off. But here we have an explosive start from James where he played Mana Crypt of his own, which taps for two mana, Ancient Tomb, which taps for two mana, and um, rushes out the Thought Not Seer, which is a 4-4 that exiles a card from his opponent's hand. So what he does is he just exiles the answer. He exiles the Chain of Vapor so his opponent can't. Um, bounce his uh, Thought Not Seer or Lock Piece. It's very strong, and I think even just mentally, the pressure that Thought Not Seer is a five turn clock and it's going to stress Trevi out now with that mana crypt that every, every one of those dice rolls or coin flips is going to be really crucial because it could change the clock a lot and that might force Trevi to make a suboptimal play trying to rush out the combo when he's not ready. The interesting part here is that. Um, James chooses to get rid of the Windfall, um, He rather than getting rid of the Chain of Vapor. He knows that Trevi scryed to the top, so he's assuming that it's a mana source that turns on the uh, Mox Opal. And the possibility that when... Um, and here we go, it's... Uh, well, he can't actually do that, so because there's no Metalcraft. But he plays a third artifact, which is a Soul Ring. So that was, uh, just to clarify, he obviously was thinking uh, much further ahead. So he's brainstorming here. See, the main reason that um, uh, Thought Not Seer took the Windfall is because James didn't actually play a lock piece. So Thought Not Seer isn't a lock piece, it's disruption. So once he passes the turn over to his opponent, his Storm opponent can do anything he wants. The card's gone from his hand, but he can do anything he wants. So if the Windfall was in his hand and there was a mana source at the top, which is what uh, James is playing around, um, Trevi casts Windfall, gets to draw uh, four new cards, and uh, possibly go off with that. So he's uh, done the safe route by taking the Windfall, which is technically exiled. It's in his graveyard. It's not going to be relevant, but it, technically it's exiled. And um, this is going to uh, essentially, what James is hoping, is going to hamstring Trevi a little bit more. I totally agree with it as well. You don't want to take the Chain of Ever because we were talking about how relevant the Chain of Ever is, but... Trevi only had three cards in hand, and if you take something else, and then Trevi does cast a Chain of Vapor, you know, and it's bouncing something good, then he's left with one card in hand, and he's going to really struggle to get that mass amount uh, that he needs to to go off. So I think it's uh, it's definitely the safe play, mm. and I think it was the correct play as well. Yeah, deny the card draw. So uh, Trevi's making the difficult decision here of... Uh, uh, he's still partway through the brainstorm, is that right? Or... Yeah, I I don't think he's put yeah. too so back yet. He's still deciding on where to put uh, where, which cards to put back. Um, it can be a sign that your opponent is engineering a means by which to win uh, within either now or going. I hope you don't pay a lock piece, and I'm going to win next turn. But um, if if he snapped and put two cards straight back and then passed a the turn, it's probably because he's brainstorm locked. <laughs> But here we go, you can see he's chaining his spells. He's going into the, the um, uh, uh, Gataxian Probe to look at his opponent's hand for free, essentially, losing two life and drawing a card, which is drawing back one of those brainstormed cards. So as you can see, imagine if James had some kind of thorn effect that uh, taxed his opponent. His opponent would not have been able to go Soul Ring, Brainstorm, and Phyrexi, uh, Phyrexi, uh, the um, uh, uh, Gataxian Probe. So that's why... Uh, James took that windfall. It was it was uh, the main route for his opponent to get back in the game. Just looking at James's hand here, that is pretty strong. Tangle wise, uh, a really strong card, but only and especially 
if you've got a threat on the board. Tangaway is going to just gum up that game, really slow it down. He can tap. Everyone's going to be tapping out their lands, and that Thought Nazi is just going to get in there mm. every time. Now the Chalice as well is obviously... So he's done Chalice for one here. So detrimental. I mean, Chalice's mana cost is X, X, and he's choosing X as one, so it costs him two, but it if it resolves, will counter every one mana spell. I don't think Trevi's got much hope after that. Telerian Academy could get him a huge amount of mana, and then maybe he can Paradoxical, yep. because Paradoxical is still four, so obviously he can cast it. He can get a lot of mana out, so it's still scary days for James, but I think that Tangle Wire might just be a little bit too much. Yeah, the, the Tangle Wire is probably one of the biggest issues here, because unless his opponent draws Talarian Academy, it's going to come out for three mana, and uh, at the beginning of each uh, person's turn, they're tapping out four permanents and three permanents and two permanents. So um, out comes a Chain of Vapor, returning the Thought Not Seer at the end of turn. And we have... <laughs> yeah, uh, it was in response to the, the Chalice so that it wouldn't get counted. So James knew that his opponent had uh, Chain of Vapor, which cost one in hand, so it was a use it or lose it situation there. Obviously, the chalice is going to have a longer-lasting effect as well. One thing about the Tangle Wire, though, to be fair, Telerian Academy, uh, if he can hit that and then hit Paradoxical, he can float mana and Paradoxical bounce all these things back, draw for them, and then have the Tangle Wire trigger. So uh, because Paradoxical Outcome is an instant, he he may be able to play around it a bit, but... Um, Mm, yeah, t Tango Wire is definitely tough, especially when you've got that many permanents out uh, on the other side. Mm. I, I, I do like that play of uh, Paradoxical in your upkeep in response to having all your stuff tapped. That's a nice one. Um, it, only, it only works if your opponent doesn't play some kind of uh, taxing effect like a sphere. So, um, And at the moment, that that is definitely Trevi's one of his many outs. He's got... Uh, top deck library, uh, top deck uh, academy, because that will just tap for exorbitant amounts of mana. He needs to generate mana. So once he can generate mana, he can cast a paradoxical outcome or something. So the Phyrexian Invoker comes out, and we'll see what it's naming. But usually in this case, he names something like Soul Ring or mana, not mana crypt, because he, he himself has a mana crypt, and it will b both of them will be turned off. Yeah, I reckon I'd actually name um, Mox Ruby or the Mox Opal, because... Yep. Denying blue. If he Trevi does Paradoxical, and let's face it, that's the only way he's going to win, because of that Chalice of the Void, he's not going to be able to recast the Sol Ring. Mm. So the Sol Ring isn't point. that much of an issue. I think it's the it's the Ruby. But he's named uh, Mox Opal, it looks like. That's why Trevi's Denying blue the is, is, is fine. And there's multiple Mox Opals in Trevi's list. So uh, Mox Opals are legendary, so you can tap it, and then play a second one, and the legendary rule says that you have to uh, sacrifice one of them, but obviously you sacrifice the tap one, so you can actually generate uh, mana, and it is relevant if you have two in hand. So Like Lotus Petal, becoming multiple Lotus Petal. That's right. So he's looking for the... Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> this is the exact situation we it were talking about. Him. He brings in Blightsteel Colossus, okay. and uh, it's a nice way to... Because in this in, on this board, imagine it, him casting Tinker. Mm. He could Tinker away the dead Mox Opal if he wanted to, and or the Minor Crypt, so he didn't die uh, from losing Minor Crypt flips, and just have a Blight Steel on the board. Right, it looks pretty silly when he top decks it, but um, you know, if that, as you say, if that was Tinker, then uh, uh, what a board that otherwise looked pretty unplayable is suddenly you've got a, you've got a few options that Thought Not has to hold back to block and. Um, it's not looking good for James, mm. but he didn't hit it, and now if he does draw the Tinker, it's uh, not going to get a Blight Steel, is it? Yeah. So Trevi scoops here. I mean, there was an out. There was not not losing the Minor Crypt flip, and no, there wasn't an out because he's <laughs> not. He's going to be all tapped out before his. Uh, he'll have to tap six permanents from four from one Tangle Wire, two from another, and it wouldn't. There's the out was no. There wasn't an out. I don't think it, the so. out involved drawing too many cards, and it wouldn't work. He, he'd need to draw both academy and something else, or uh, outcome time walk outcome. It just it doesn't it doesn't work. So uh, that's that. This is exactly how we expected the matchup to play out. Um, the the deck that hates on um, paradoxical 
uh, the paradoxical deck. If you are playing Storm and your opponent um, doesn't win on turn one, that's the end. We didn't see it, but uh, the paradoxical deck still scary. I, I, you know, even if I was playing James's list, I'd still be scared of that turn one win. So, um, so these guys are going to go on into uh, another friendly match, I believe. So we'll let them do that. Uh, I know that they know each other and uh, uh, love jamming games. So uh, let's move on to round two. Thank you very much for watching. Thanks for watching, guys.